Hello, listening people. Hello. You're listening to Spit and Polish Presents. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Swinski. And I am Bartek. Ooh, you really leaned into the R. You rolled the R there in Bartek Ooh. today. Yes, authentic name calling today. Ooh, not real, well, somewhat authentic. You've got to use your, f- your full real first name. Bartłomiej <laughs> Piotr Kaspszyszak. You didn't roll the R's in that one. Well, there is an R in it, but it's like an RZ, so it makes a bit of a different sound. Okay, I I speak Polish, so I'll allow you. And to what's do your it. name? First name again? Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> and you married? I married a Rachel. <laughs> Um, we're here spitting and being Polish, talking about movies that have come recommended for our show, Pictures Pow Wow. Good name. Uh, it's a great name. Great name. I'm glad that we agreed on the name. You came up with it and I ticked it off and said, no, 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 no. That's the name of the show, Bartek. And we are talking about a movie that came recommended from uh, listening people. Uh, actually, someone you know. Uh, do you want to fill us in on uh, who recommended the movie and what one we're talking about today? Yes, yes, yes. It's uh, my stepbrother, Maciek, who previously has recommended Bedazzled and Desperado for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, three times the charm, third times the charm as it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has recommended another film for us, this one, even older than those two. Mm-hmm. Those two very old films, as we already know they are. And not as funny. And uh, Not as funny, but there is a guy, there's a point where they say balls. <laughs> Tis somewhat funny, balls. Tis somewhat funny, balls. There was balls in last week's episode as well. Anyway, the film that he recommended is 1982's Pink Floyd, The Wall. Yes, the uh, concept album brought to the big screen. That is the film. And of course, if people, if you're not, if you have not seen this film, watch it. Give it a go. It is relatively short. It's only 95 minutes long, I do believe. It's not that big of a film in, for what you think especially when you're thinking of rock operas br- on 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 the big screen on on in cinema usually like tommy's longer than this and mm. so yeah watch it for yourself if you're a fan or not of pink floyd but you are at all interested in seeing it for yourself give it a go because we're going to talk about it it's kind of hard to say spoilers but also i guess we'll talk about the nitty-gritty details and Mm. all of that stuff so uh bartek you're i mean you're the person who um has i guess some connection to this i don't know what's your history with this i mean your stepbrother recommended it and i know the last sometimes with him you guys watch movies together and sometimes yeah, the, you don't so the la- where is this yeah the last two films that he recommended i'd only ever seen with him prior to mm. doing it on the show this one i had never seen before and i'm honestly not sure if he has either i know that he's he and his dad have always liked uh pink floyd and i remember growing up hearing another brick in the wall part two a lot mm. um pardon me <laughs> um yeah so i i I'm passingly familiar with a couple of elements from this film, mainly that song, but also uh, in pop culture and some media that I think both of us consume, there are often like references or allusions. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we both watch Jim Sterling's videos mm-hmm. uh, and they often use like the shot of the 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 trial, the cartoon version mm-hmm. of the teacher, like grinding the meat. Yeah, there's lots of visuals and iconography that have sustained, even if you have not seen the film itself. Yes, yes. And um, originally I was thinking of doing a gag where I, I set a timer for this episode to see how long it takes for us to bring up uh, that recent thing in recent years that happened regarding this film. Um, but that recent thing also uh, has brought a lot of, you know, elements of that to the forefront. Mm-hmm. So even though I'm not familiar with a lot of the songs in this, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember hearing uh, the Doug Walker version <laughs> of this song. No, He's me, the real you, one. You mean the Nostalgia Critic version. Doug and the Nostalgia <laughs> Critic are different. You see, his shit takes don't count because it's a character, you see. We don't know what Doug's takes are. It's a love letter, his review <laughs> and his comedy album. That's what we know. I was giggling to myself because we name our episodes, you know, Pictures, Pow Wow, Hyphen, then the title of the film. The last three words are going to be The Wall Review, and you know, mm. those three words are just kind of funny together. Thanks they to- are funny together, aren't they? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so you haven't seen this yourself, and you're not too sure if he's seen this. 
Yeah, I definitely have to ask him next time because I, I know he's he likes Pink Floyd, and or at least he likes that one song. Yeah, I would imagine if if they're a fan of Floyd in any way, they've most likely seen this movie because that's where I come in with this. I my I have a a, a good taste. I, I have a big taste in that era of music. Uh, we've done Tommy on this podcast, which I again would recommend is a great companion to watch with this. I would like to hear your thoughts on that a bit later, mm. if you agree or not, because you've seen that film too. Obviously, we did that for the podcast, but. Uh, I like Pink Floyd, I like David Bowie, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, there's a whole bunch of those guys back in the day I like. Pink Floyd is not one that my family and I listen to all the time. They are very, uh, as you can tell, very specific. They're a mood piece band. You don't just whack on Pink Floyd for the fun of it as easily as you can with some of the other musicians I mentioned. Hell, Lou Reed is kind of in a similar boat where you can only, you, you don't chuck on Lou Reed's Berlin just willy nilly mm-hmm. and the wall is similar in terms of the album and in terms of the film as well i've only seen this film twice now three times one time the first time i saw it it was on tv and it was halfway through it was during the scene it was during one of the scenes where he's uh, on the hill watching the tv one of those where he's watching the old black and white world war Two movie about mm. the dog yeah, who's got an appropriate? Who's got a very uh, <laughs> inappropriate name uh, by modern standards, and even then, uh, which was a real film. That's a real film. Uh, so I remember tuning in, and he's shaven, and and it's this moody, very expressive piece. And then I've seen it again, and now again. And the thing I can say about my journey with this film is, I lament that we don't get these often. Mm. Uh, I, to give my kind of thought, like my opinion on it, I don't love this movie. I don't love The Wall. It's not going to be something I will watch all that regularly, uh, but I appreciate it very much. And I wish that there were more films of this nature, more of these music album things brought to life in this manner where you walk away from it. And I, although not loving all of it, I would say it's art. This yeah. is art. This is an this is art. You may say it's pretentious, but I say it's art. And the last time I think of something like this is uh Daft Punk did something like this as well. They Oh really? They had some album of theirs. I, I I'd have to look back into it. I'm not a huge Daft Punk fan. I like their last album. That's very ironic. I like that. I remember listening their their um random Access Memory album, I do believe, is their last one. And it was like, when it came out, I listened to it, and I'm like, oh, I like this. And then little did I know it would be their last one. So I was like, oh, I don't know. But they had a, I'm pretty sure they had a movie or something where they, it was animated. The whole thing was animated, and it was like these blue people. Uh, I'd have to double check if that was a full film or if it was like a, a short thing where it was like maybe 40 minutes. I don't know. Mm. But, I, remember, I remember Machek liking them as well. Maybe he yeah. knows what it is. <laughs> but uh, so, Bartek, walk me through. What did you? What was your journey with uh, with this? Yeah, it was it was definitely interesting. Um, I have some similar thoughts to what you were saying. Like, I don't love this film. Um, I don't even know if I'd necessarily say that I like it that much, but definitely it, it is art. There were many elements of it that visually were very captivating. Um, this might sound like a, a dumb statement, but a bunch of neurons were connecting in my head when certain things were happening. Um, you know, tying back to things like I, I basically... Even though I'd never seen the film and I hadn't heard the album all the way through, I just knew like the one or two songs. Yeah. Um, kind of from the fallout of, you know, that Nostalgia Critic review and also maybe some general pop culture osmosis, I did have an understanding of the point of the film, like that it's about this one man who, uh, thanks to his life traumas, has erected a metaphorical wall around himself and mm. it's his slow slip into insanity. Yeah. Um, and so when I started watching the film, even though I didn't know everything that was in it, I was basically having that idea in my head, pointing out different things like, okay, World War Two, and then schooling, uh, relationships, things like that. Um, so I was connecting most of it together, which mm. I was 
very thankful for for you know death an, of a father death of a father yeah. yep for for a very artsy film like this definitely if you do not get it i don't know if you really have any business doing any sort of review of it i yeah yeah doug um <laughs> that's a thing that's very interesting is what i like about the wall in general i'm going to call it just the in general this is the music this is the concerts that they've done uh this film the, the the metaphor that is the wall is such a malleable one where you could mold it and apply it to facets of your own existence as well as what this film is presenting to you with the father who went off to war and died and the single and you know the mother and his wife and all that this this concept of the ways that these moments in your life build yes another brick in the wall of you and you could apply it to whatever so for Mm. me i can easily look at this and go there's this element of masculinity there's with guys we are conditioned in lots of ways to when we have a emotional trauma we just suppress it and we just keep it in and we just build another wall and it just goes on top of each other until eventually you snap or something goes wrong and see that's one way to look at this and that's what i like about this as a piece of art and thought because this film obviously gives you a narrative it's not told in a conventional way but it's a pretty i mean to me it's a pretty simple story about a guy whose father died at war and he's raised this way and he's yearning for this and like you say, building up this wall until eventual madness and gets into crime and has to actually face the consequences of where they are at and break down that wall in the end. Mm -hmm. And heck, even the last visual of the movie is children, the next generation, having to clean up the mess left behind. Mm -hmm. Just like how he has had to do the same for the trauma of World War II, right? So, yeah, I think what, I, what I've really come to appreciate is there is this cultural osmosis that we've talked about here, whether it be reviews of this or the album or the songs or the visuals. But what's really hearkening to me is the creative masterstroke of the actual, the actual wall itself as an idea that you can spin off into various different avenues of creation even. Because... The album is slightly different to this, obviously. And then the movie is what it is. And then the stage shows, they keep adding these different things. And I actually got to see a few years ago, by happenstance, Roger Waters live. Mm -hmm. It's just him and he's performing all of his Pink Floyd songs and other songs. And of course, he performed a great amount from The Wall. And when he did Another Brick and, you know, Another Brick and Wall Part 2, they got school children on, like from Melbourne, they got some school and they got these primary school kids on to sing and do this whole routine. And it was awesome. It was amazing. And obviously when I saw it, this was in the context of we were, uh, I think this was just on the precipice of Trump and Mm -hmm. definitely on the Brexit side of history. So when I saw his version of like these songs from the wall, the allegory and metaphors were different to how we see it here with this movie. But I still was struck by it in that way where the conceit, that central thing of the metaphor of the wall, you just hit it. And it, like I say, you can go with so many different interpretations and directions with this. What do you think about all that? No, for sure. I definitely see that too. Um, I know that uh, Alex from I Hate Everything, uh, when he described this film on a video that he did, uh, he talked about how it's a very personal film, and so mm. you know, obviously that's coming across from the film itself to the audience. Um, but then also, like you were saying, with um, you know, the masculinity stuff, there are so many things in it that are relatable. Mm. Um, so it's it's personal without being too isolating in concept for people. So like you said, you, it, you can relate it to other d- different issues like that. Um, and certainly, where was I going with this? <laughs> You're building another brick there. Yes, yeah, so, so, certainly, uh, 
a lot of the personal elements of this are built up from uh, historical context of like World mm-hmm. War Two, the education system in England in the nineteen sixties, yeah. cultural context, as cultural well as context, historical. Yeah. and like even like me, I, I work as a teacher now, and I see the education industry of now and see how different it is to uh, in the film. Yeah, seeing how in a in a weird way, like what it's doing is causing damage, but in the short term, like the teachers hitting the kids and they're getting mm-hmm. them to behave, and there is this almost catharsis of like, oh yeah, if only it were that simple, and it wouldn't mm-hmm. have repercussions. And yeah, and and with you being a teacher, you have your context. With me, I grew up in rural Australia with my schooling system, and I watched this movie, and I relate very much so to it. Mm, while you've you told me your horror stories. Well, yeah. you you would have different context as well from now being a teacher but also from your own schooling experience in which yeah, you private went catholic school private catholic school in the suburbs different worlds like mm. on so so yeah there's all of these things but like i think one of the things that's really great to, to bounce off of what you're talking about here is we studied drama at university and one of the things i remember very viscerally is there was a unit we did where we had to make monologues off of our own personal experience in life yep and we had to transform it into something and i don't know about you but there was a great section of those monologues that people would do that were too uh too removed or isolating for me and audience to relate to because it was too close to the person telling the story in which they they only understood the needed context Mm. of that story or their monologue while here there is enough artistic liberties taken in which it becomes a far more universal experience to watch it's not just you are watching roger waters cry in the corner about how he had a bad time at school right it's Mm. got all these other elements that heighten it as well that brings you in right the fact that it's a lot of it is so heightened and yet still you can relate to it in a way is quite impressive because you know it's you lost your dad in world war ii you know not all of us were born that early no um you had a schooling system of a very specific time you know again not all of us were alive at that time Mm. um you are a very, very famous musician who performs on stage and you have your own experiences from that. Again, not everyone can relate to that, but there is, you know, all these, like, common things of, like, uh, family trauma, um, the developmental years in mm-hmm. school. Identity. Identity. Purpose. Purpose. Anyone who has, like, kind of been in a position of any sort of power, you know, you might relate a bit more to... Again, this is something that wasn't really in the film, but I didn't know about it until after I'd finished it. Like the the inciting incident of the formation of this whole album, yeah, where he Roger Waters, I think it was, mm. spat on a fan, yeah. and not only was he disgusted at himself for having done it, but he was shocked at the fact that the fan like enjoyed it. Yeah, he had a disconnect. There. Yeah, he didn't understand what that was, and this album, in part, is to explore that notion and. Yeah, you don't need to know that context when you watch it, but there is this element to the film as well, to to the film, the album, this whole entire thing. Especially now, like I said to you, I saw Roger Waters perform this a few years ago, where there is something about watching an artist, a writer, director, musician, be fascinated by some idea and want to keep trying to figure out what the answer is or some kind of avenue to explore with that. And that incident there gave us this, gave us this album, and then the album gave us this movie, and then it goes on and on and on. And that's how it works sometimes, right? When we do creative endeavors, sometimes the ideas, sometimes the scenes that we create, the characters we create can come from the most little of things or like little things that just jar you or or, or, or confound you or excite you, right? And this mm. is obviously his version of that. But again, there's that artistic uh, expression there in which it is not just woe is me or like so internal to that person. There is 
the ability to transform that into something that you and I, after all these years later, without all those things in common to the artists that created it, like you're talking about, like we weren't in world, we didn't have World War II parents that died and all that kind of stuff, where we in 20, you know, in 2022 can watch this and get it in some way that's personal to us, right? Yeah. Because while you were talking about the things that we, like some of the things we don't have in common in that, I was also thinking about the things that we personally do. Like, we are children. We are children of people who were affected by World War II, for sure. Being Polish, obviously, mm-hmm. right? So we understand the uh, cultural and uh, familial uh, trauma of that war, which still rings out all of these decades later. And it's kind of funny that there's a bit in the movie, right, where it becomes like neo Nazis, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh. This is still relevant today. Ha. Mm. It doesn't make you feel great. <laughs> um, but yeah, you were saying anything else you want to go jump off of there or keep going with your train of thought? Um, I, I guess, yeah, just the other thing with that was, or the other thing, the, the conclusion of that was, it, e- even though that inciting incident might not necessarily directly relate to a lot of the things in the film, it definitely explained like the the neo-Nazi and rock star side of it a bit more. Yeah, because, oh, 100%. Because, yeah, there is also this disconnect between him as a performer and his fans. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, I, I mean, briefly, because I mentioned it before, what do you think about this in relation to other pieces of media we've done here on the podcast? Because I know you... um usually like a little bit more of a conventional structure to stories, a little bit more dialogue, a little bit more obvious character beats. Like with the Neon Demon, I always bring that up as like, that was a disconnect for you in that way. And then obviously we've done Tommy, which I think to me is, is, is a film that you can draw parallels to. So what do you think about that kind of stuff when it comes to the wall? Definitely. When I walked into the film, I was thinking like, Oh, it's going to be like Tommy. And Mm. I I actually really enjoyed Tommy. So I was thinking it was going to be a similar experience to that. Um, And I think maybe I did myself a bit of a disservice in that Mm. sense, because like you said, this one is a lot less conventional in its storytelling. I tended to gravitate towards it a lot more, um, when we saw the character, our main character, Pink, in, uh, I always get these two mixed up, diegetic and non-diegetic, in, in like, his w- literal happenings, like, when he's yeah. a kid in the park and things like that, um, you know, d- a more direct, uh, look at what is happening in his life mm. versus, you know, all of the imagery that we saw before. So, like, at, before that point, you know, we saw all the soldiers in in the war they were dying they were injured they were slumping away um i can't remember everything else that happened before that point but there was also yeah the imagery in the church of like him playing with the toy while his mum him him at the park him at the park yeah well the park is the baseline of of this point um and right there i was like okay so we've got you know this kind of beginning point here Mm. we're gonna build up to you know the the sad quiet man watching tv Mm -hmm. um in these moments where it was a bit more conventional yeah i could follow it a bit more um but in a lot of the more abstract things like we have a lot of the animation sequences Mm -hmm. which were you know great to watch but um yeah just required a lot more attention and me uh thinking thinking (laughs) it's interesting because to me and maybe this is because the iconography is so iconic because like the animation Mm. is so iconic to me the animated sections were the least confounding to me in a way like i kind of when i watched it and maybe now when i talk about it i go struggle a bit more but when i watched it those are the segments if anything i was the most like oh yeah i get what this is like oh yeah for sure for sure all of that so for sure all of the like i said earlier all the neurons were connecting like okay i understand this is representing you know evil this here is representing all these elements of society that we deal with things like that um, but yeah, just relating it back to that main character, like all the specific points. Like I knew, mm. I, I in a way, because of the pop culture osmosis and the people talking about what was wrong with the review, this is what it really meant. I did walk in with like a slight checklist of things that I knew was going to happen. Like I knew there was going to be a trial with a big bum. Yeah. Um, there was going to be the teacher, things like that. Um, and I guess also trying to relate it back to that framework. Like, okay, what specific element what specific brick of the wall am i is this Mm -hmm. in reference to yeah i um 
just because we're Tommy, I think one of the differences is um, because we, maybe it's been a little while since you've watched Tommy, but Tommy does just the same kind of shit as this movie does with its visuals and its way of telling stories, and it's not conventional either, and it's longer. I think one of the differences is Tommy is more overtly fun than this. It's definitely a lot more upbeat, yeah. And, and, and not just upbeat, but like its, mu- like its music's far more groovy and fun, and the characters are far more vibrant and fun. Um, like Cousin Kevin and Uncle Ernie and the Oliver Reed character, which I know you loved, and uh, with his sexy legs. And <laughs> so you have a little chuckle. But here, it's not really about characters in that way. It's mainly about Pink. And the rest of them are, th- mm. uh, are thematic representations of things in his life. The mother's not really a character. The The wife isn't really a character. The teacher isn't really a character. But in Tommy, they are characters. Like, they have... Wants, needs, desires, dreams, hopes, all of that. But it is just as fucking bizarre. And also, both films are dealing with the trauma of World War II on a younger generation who would then grow up to be Mm. almost uh, Christ-like figures. Yeah, I did note that both of them lost a father in the war. And then they grow up to be Christ-like figures um, Mm. who, who get devoured by their fans and then they have to reject them and find their own happiness and yeah it, 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 like i i don't like i get it though like you think of tommy there is this element of like oh elton john and his big boots and it's so <laughs> fun but then you forget about the, all the like weird moments like Definitely. you do get in the in the wall like that movie doesn't necessarily have animated moments but it does have very surreal visual things that are just ongoing like there are like 10 minute chunks of that movie where it's just like For and now sure. she's writhing around on, on beans and you're like what does this mean <laughs> yeah I, I do remember there was one point where like it just like superimposed the little tommy just smiling like right in front of the camera <laughs> yeah. it's like oh what does this mean <laughs> yeah. but but with tommy like again it has been a few years but i do remember that one had a lot more of a you're kind of watching this character grow up yeah. chronologically kind of thing. Uh, and, not, right. and not necessarily that I have a problem with things being out of chronology, but like mm. th- there, w- there was an anchor to that story that like kept me a bit yeah. more invested. I guess my anchor for this one was Pink as an adult staring at the TV and every time we go back to his childhood or him further along destroying himself or getting married in the past and all that, we would always keep coming back to him in that hotel room in that apartment or whatever, just destroying himself there. And that was kind of my anchoring point of like, okay, what's what's bringing us to this point mm. uh, in the past, present, or future? What's bringing us here? I really liked, uh, you know what was actually my favorite segment? Uh, yeah, one of, my, one of my favorite segments was seeing in a matter of moments him meeting his girlfriend then marrying her and all of that i really like that say that that especially because the juxtaposition of the images we've seen of him where he's got like uh in that room where he's got like the short hair and he's like riddled and he's pale and then you cut to him at the wedding and he's like in a full three-piece suit and he's got like this luscious head of hair that's like very poofy and Hmm. he looks like the rock star he's supposed to be And I really like that sequence of events, like how they could, in a very short moment of time, just give us who this character is that he's marrying. Like, okay, we get it. They met like this. They have sex. They do this. And before you know it, they're married. Like, just time has accelerated in that manner. I love when movies can can do that, when they can just accelerate through time in that in that way. And the music. It was obviously helpful to that as as well. What was a standout sequence for you? Um, it feels almost well dare to say, but I really enjoyed a lot of the animation sequences, yeah. especially the early on ones. Um, all, all the shots of like the the black birds with like the mm. blood dripping off of them, just like really striking visuals. And you know, any moment where like a thing would be quote unquote normal and then start decaying, it's just like, oh wow, this is this is really cool. Yeah, I really like the flowers, the um, mm. sexual and fucking, and then they just turn into other things. I like that visual. And uh, yeah, the the animation's gorgeous. Did you know that the animator of this would go on to work f- and does do the character designs or the initial character designs for Disney's 
Hercules. Oh, Hercules, right? I didn't know it while watching, but afterwards I was like, mm-hmm. oh, interesting. I'm pretty sure he at least did the character design work, if not the actual animation stuff, but they did come to him at some point. And when I was watching this, I was thinking about um, the two... I, it's been too long since I've watched Hercules, but the two uh, dumbass demon guys that yeah. work for, for Hades. Yeah. I was thinking about them a lot because their designs... And also the oracles, with the blind women, the oracles. I was thinking about those mm. characters in relation to this movie, and I'm like, I could see them being just in this movie. Easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those women could, they could look kind of decaying, mm-hmm. and, the, and they're and the green one of that duo, like yeah. it's this really sharp nose. Like yeah. a lot of the stuff in this film was very sharp. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. But you're right. The animation is 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 great standout stuff. The the blackbird stuff. I love when it transforms into like the the big plain looking thing the big fighter the, the bombers the bomber yeah, yeah. yeah it's so it's so fluid and good i also love that too about the animation it it it, it juggles and bounces between be- being very fluid being very fluid and transforming into one thing into the next but and then also being very rough and stiff and uh hard like transitions and fades and uh, jittery transformations as well what did you think about that kind of thing where it kind of had a bit of both there, where sometimes a, a flower will quickly turn into a gun, and then other times you see the bird, and it's like these still images, and then it fades, and then it's moved again, and then fades and moved again, and it's slowly transforming into a building. Like it has the ability to be very dynamic and then very abrasive. Mm, yeah, very, very lucidy, trippy kind of thing going mm. on. It's like yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't do any of the drugs or anything like that, but certainly this evokes that kind of feeling of like ooh, this is this kind of imagery that you would see when you're tripping balls bro <laughs> wow he said bro <laughs> maybe it should have said dude dude how about or man guy guy <laughs> um <laughs> guy uh yeah i i i personally also did enjoy the childhood flashbacks and it's because i thought the child actor was very good Mm -hmm. i thought he was very very good he's his expressions the look on his face the he was very if you don't this is the thing where i i think this movie is one where you could turn the sound off and you would get what's happening yeah, for you sure. You understand the flow of it. And a huge part of that comes down to the child's performance in those flashbacks. His face, especially when uh, the mum comes in with the doctor at night and they're unbuttoning him and doing all of that. The look on his face during that whole entire sequence gives you so much more than any of those lyrics ever can. Mm. And so, The whole sequence at the park, too. Like Even mm. even in the shots where you couldn't see his face, it's just the actions, the things that he's surrounded by. Body language, yeah. Body language, the relationship with that other kids father yeah 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 it's uh it's it's very palpable stuff and that's not to say that bob geldof who plays the adult version of pink doesn't do i mean he's striking you remember his face it's very gaunt and those eyes are very uh piercing but that kid Mm. i don't know it's just maybe it's just also the trick of it's a kid having to go through these harsh things while still being British and having to be stiff up a lip and take it on the chin because that's what that kid's going through. I, I mean, one of the most iconic scenes is of course the, uh, the poetry scene where the teacher ridicules him for mm. writing poetry. And in that scene, it was the same kid, right? Yeah. Just looked a bit different because he was a bit older. Because he was in his school uniform. School uniform. Because yeah. he had his hair slick. Yeah, his was hair was school. different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, like I said the, uh, earlier when I was talking about the thing anchoring me, I did kind of center it on that kid because mm. kids are impressionable. And so obviously when you have the scenes with the kids, you're going to see a lot of things that have uh, formed them up to that point, but also the things that are currently forming them now, because we know, you know, what he's going to become. Uh, and that's, you know, what we get out of the the park scene, showing us the sadness he has of not having a father figure. And then, of course, of the school scene where, you know, the, the whole trauma with the schooling was at that time. And here we see it happening. Yeah. Oh, 100. Oh, yeah. And uh, the teacher... Probably one of the greatest performances in the entire movie as well. Mm. He he makes a scene memorable as well as the kid. I mean, he's striking. Oh man. yeah, well his, he, like I said, growing up I'd known the song and his voice is in that, you mm. know, shouting things, shouting the line, "Eat your vegetables." I love the. <laughs> 
the visuals there though of uh you get why he's like the way he is because of his wife and mm. he goes home and he then he gets he he gets uh, uh, like emotionally abused so he then goes back to school and physically abuses and emotionally abuses them too and his wife appears in the trial thing as well mm. oh yeah mm-hmm. she gets her little moment um little yeah <laughs> she's big oh <laughs> uh and he's little Mm. Um, but no, I, I, I think, uh, the, the, the movie does an excellent job at communicating its themes and its metaphors, but without, uh, I don't know, people who don't like this movie would say, and we can get into it. I, I, I imagine you read some behind the scenes trivia, maybe, uh, a little bit. There is a almost uh, school level way of appro- uh, what I mean is the representation of metaphors in this can also be criticized as being very on the nose, amateurish, school project filmy. Like, hey, look, I filmed something in black and white. Doesn't that mean it's meaningful? And that's a critique to be made. Obviously, the Doug Walker, as the nostalgia critic, was trying to make that critique, but did it in a most epic fail lol way. But the creators of this also feel similar uh, from what I've read. And again, I don't know what the current stance on this is from all involved, but uh, Roger Waters didn't like it. He thought it was too depressing. He thought Pink was too vile of like too too uh emotionally distant of a character for the audience to relate to in any way which i i found weird because i did i i understand I, I felt for pink um i didn't understand pink at points but that's a, i think that's the point you're not supposed to always understand them but you are on an emotional level getting it uh the one of the guitarists said that this is the uh least successful implementation of the wall like the album's better, the concert's better. Like this is the least in uh, mm-hmm. the the animation guy, the production designy guy, the animation designer guy. I think he was on record as saying he just doesn't under- he doesn't understand why people like this movie at all. And the director uh, said that uh, this is the greatest. Uh, this is the biggest. Uh, school project film ever put to screen like it is yeah. that st- it is just that kind of down for them like what we were putting here was just at the level that you would do in film school yeah that last thing is the only one that i'd heard um, yeah so all the rest of them kind of surprised me <laughs> yeah at least according to imdb that's what's been said i don't again mm. they may have all changed their stances even if those were the case because some of those people are talking about like they don't get the they don't get the appeal that the movie has, but maybe over time they do. I mean, uh, that's just how it works. Sometimes maybe they don't. Maybe they still don't like it. But evidently, this has struck a chord with people. Um, what were some other elements of the of this that worked for you? Um, other elements of it that worked for me. Let me just scan over the film in my mind. Um, oh, by the way, similar to when we did the, uh, 60s Batman film, I found this film on Facebook. Someone uploaded it to some page. So, yeah, every other version I could find was way too quiet. So I found a Facebook one that was just fine. That's something I'll, I'll, I'll give a positive to. Sound design was great. Mm. I really love the mixing of the, the dialogue is very faint and it, feels like it's at the back of the room that gives a great emphasis to the music and just how he is so zoned out to what's going on around him that the dialogue itself is very off in the distance because it it doesn't matter to him what bob hoskins is saying or what his wife is saying especially the wife scenes Mm. where she's trying to communicate with him and then just can't be bothered because he can't be bothered and that was great that's a that's one i just want to highlight i don't know if you have any opinion on on that Ah, uh, no, no, it was all good. Um, something else that struck with me. Uh, I remember, I can't remember what the name of the song was, but it was one where the visual was just him, like, banging on the wall. Is, mm. it, was, is somebody out there or something like that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember that one uh, struck me. Mm. Um, mainly because, yeah, for most of the film, when we do see big pink, you know, adult pink, he is this he is self isolated you know even when you just simply look at him he's he's still he's just staring at the t v um 
you're not really getting uh, something directly out of the body that you're looking at. And then here mm. in this scene where he's banging on the wall, is there anybody out there? You do get this... It, it really, I guess like you said earlier, it, it is very direct in its metaphor of like, oh, he's stuck in the wall banging, everything on the other side of the wall is outside the wall. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that that really highlight, highlighted, highlighted the self-isolation element. Yeah. I mean, it's... It's a great moment, and the wall is this big thing that just you can't tear that down. I I mean, uh, there's so many things that I do love about the movie. The music's great for me. I'm a bigger fan of this than this type of music than than you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so this does get to me. I mean, comfortably numb. Great song. Uh, Goodbye, Blue Sky. Another Brick in the Wall Part Two. Even Part One's good. Yeah, I agree. There's it's just one of those things where it's like um. Pink Floyd, right? They're a big band. They're one of the most beloved bands of all time. Uh, they they the they have albums like Dark Side of the Moon, right, where people just say greatest album of all time. Greatest album of all time. And you there's there's a level of uh I don't know, they come across as almost impenetrable in that way. I don't know if you get that at all what I'm saying there of they're so revered, and this is just another element of 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 their status of as artists that just makes it, uh, for some people, a little bit lackluster when you actually do it. Like the hype is built up, like the wall and and all their albums, Pink Floyd. They're one of the greatest bands ever. That sometimes when people go to it, it can be a real oh okay. I'll be honest. Like growing up, even though I knew the song and you know the name of the wall and things like that. I didn't actually know all that much about the band itself. In fact, I didn't even know if it was a band or just one guy. Mm -hmm. Like, there's the guy that calls himself Pink Floyd, Mm -hmm. the guy who made all these songs. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even know that I could tell you what they looked like, even if you showed me a photo of them. It just... Mm -hmm. There is this sort of like impenetrable thing to them. And I think when I was reading up trivia about, I can't remember if it was for the band itself or the movie, like... Uh, it pointed out that in a lot of their, not so much promotional things, but like in their cover art and, you know, various art like that relating to their albums, they don't tend to put pictures of themselves mm-hmm. on them. So it does create, I was going to say a disconnect, but a wall, I guess would be the more appropriate word yeah. between themselves and the audience. And even when we were talking about the inciting incidents, the spitting on the fan, I think I read a detail that like, it was through a chain link fence. And so there mm. was a wall of sorts between them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Pink Floyd, I mean, their albums, like you said, they don't usually have them on them. And what they do have though, is iconic pieces of art in their own right. That for some people are what they know of Pink Floyd outside of the music. Like I could show you album covers of theirs and you go, Oh, that, Oh, that's a Pink Floyd thing. I mean, obviously, uh, we've got, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, you've got the, the triangle with the beam of light coming out of it, and that's like an iconic image I'll show you, and you go, oh, yes, I've seen I'm that. I'm pretty uh, sure I know the A million times. Yeah. And my personal favorite is, I'm forgetting the name of the album now, but there's this one great album cover I love. It's 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 just a visual I like where it's like, uh, uh, I think it's two businessmen shaking hands, but one of them's just on fire, like completely on fire. <laughs> and it's like a picture, like these, like these two guys and one of them, they've just covered in the things and lit them on fire. I love that one a lot. And yeah, there, there, there is an element of a mythos here. Like with say David Bowie, for instance, where David Bowie's last album almost feels like it is a religious tome because it's, the culmination of decades of this guy's career and it's this self-reflection on the fact that he's dying and it's like you can't just listen to black star as like a normal album that you listen to like other musicians it's like this whole entire big tapestry in which it almost can be in an impenetrable thing like i don't think you could easily listen to that last album and i think the wall has that element to it for some people out there, it doesn't for me, but that's also because I, I know Pink Floyd a little bit more. I'm not the biggest Pink Floyd fan, but I kind of get that. So I was curious if you had that element at all going in or watching it or coming out of it of that level of that there. What do you think? I know that with me, when it comes to like music and musicals and things like that, I tend to just gloss over lyrics a lot. Mm. 
And I knew that for this film, that would be a real problem because so much of the story is being told in the lyrics. Like, you know, there are strings of consciousness lyrics happening there. Like when he's the, you know, fascist guy, mm. he's like talking about all the, the people to discriminate against. Mm. Um, you've got all these like little poetic things about, you know, missing his father, things like that. So when you mentioned yeah. earlier that like you could almost mute some scenes and get things out of that. I think visually that's what most of the stimulus I was taking in was. Mm. And whenever I was trying to listen to the lyrics, it was kind of like a, you know, you're focusing on your breathing now. It's like, okay, mm. I have to kind of analyze this because I'm doing a review and I don't want to make myself look silly. So oh, that's interesting. So when you just yeah. listen to songs just casually, what does draw your focus? Is it the actual music itself, the beats, the rhythm? I think so. I always I always kind of relate it to the fact that I like Bollywood so much. Uh, like, I don't know the language there. I like a lot of songs that aren't in English and I don't speak the language. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, kind of everything else about it that's catchy is kind of what I gravitate towards. And I gravitate, I, I, and I think a lot of people do gravitate towards the vocalist. and mm. the Oh, lyrics. yeah, the, the sound of the words coming out. The, the, yeah, the sound and uh, the actual lyrics. I get drawn to lyrics. So, uh, But then sometimes, you know, I also agree music, the actual music, the beats and the rhythm and the sound and the bass. Oh, the bass and all of that. Like, Rachel and I last night, for some reason, uh, Rachel had accidentally played a, a video and it was the music video for Turn Down For What, which is a song. And the lyrics to that is Turn Down For What. That's it. That's the lyrics over and over again. Mm-hmm. And the and it's one of those, like, I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, I don't know what the proper vernacular for what genre it is, but, you know, modern-y, techno-y, hip-hop-y thing. And the film clip's amazing. And I, but by God, do I will, will I forever remember, turn down for what? Do, 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 do. And it's like, it's one of those things where it's like that song literally only has like one lyric over and over again. But boy, will I remember that <laughs> lyric because it's said in such an aggressive tone of voice and party tone. And But it's weird because it's like the music's great, but what do I remember? Turn down for what? <laughs> it's like, what turn, What am I turning down for? <laughs> I guess also with the um the thing I said about, you know, foreign languages, like whenever they do throw an English line in there, oh, you like, notice it. that obviously stands out. Like I'm watching the second Gundam show and like the opening is in Japanese, but then there's one point where it's like, I want to have a pure mm-hmm. time. Everyone's a noble mind. I'm like, okay, yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I get distracted like that when it's just in dialogue of any foreign film and there's that one word that doesn't have any translation that isn't in English, and that, <laughs> that, is, that it has to be in English. Like, it's just so funny to me. Like, we talked about that with the Bollywood films. Uh, no, the music to me is, is really well. What I was uh, astonished by on the rewatch, because again, I haven't watched this in, many times and not in a while is and i was curious of your thoughts on this the songs aren't always and and rarely are particularly that long Mm. like with most musicals like again compare it to tommy you'll have like a full four minute maybe five minute musical number where things are happening well here there'll be some songs that last maybe a minute It'll be like yeah. wilting in and then it'll go away and then it will be ambiance and then something else will happen and blah. They're like, to me, when um Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 kicks in, that's like the first song in the movie where it's like, this feels like it's a full song. And even yeah. that is inter- interjected with scenes. Yeah, and I was going to say that one, like the transition between the previous song is literally just a scream. So it feels yeah. like it's two songs actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was just, um, I was thinking, curious yeah. what you thought about that because, uh, that could it, it be something. Is, it is definitely a good point. Some of them feel very short. Um, I know you competed to Tommy, but me, I just thought of, um, Oliver mm-hmm. and in Oliver, like the short songs are at least like, you know, two, three minutes still. And, right. and then there's like the two or three really long ones. So yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think even when I was watching, I'm like, oh, that song's over. Or is, it, oh, is this part of the previous song? No, this is a different song. Yeah, and there's uh, there's something about the the 60s, 70s British rock uh, aesthetic that you're either on board for or you're not, whether it's aesthetic in the music or their visuals. 
And I'm on board for it, of course. And even though they're not at all related, and I'm sure Roger Waters would be spitting mad if I even mentioned it, but there were little things here and there that reminded me of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory for some (laughs) fucking reason. (laughs) Because it's that era. It's that era where, like, 60s, 70s England dealing with things and using the music and 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 the things to be... um, biting because that's the thing people forget that willy wonka and the chocolate factory that movie is a very biting film people Mm. forget about that but it's very biting about (laughs) society especially of that era and people forget about the documentarian side of that movie i did too until i I rewatch i only watched it once the red letter media video on it where they were talking about how like before before we even meet willy wonka we're still in the golden tickets need to be found thing like most scenes are Shot just like documentaries. Shot like documentaries or are just things that are on TV at the time, mm. yeah. Yeah. By the way, way to, sh- way to name drop one of the films I was shortlisting for my next choice. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't go with it, but I was considering it. I was thinking, You've like, oh. You've said this, like, so many times. <laughs> where you're like, oh, I want to do Willy Wonka. Yeah. Like, li- I'm sitting here waiting. <laughs> <laughs> We're all waiting, Bartek. Um, anything negatively you want to talk about this? Because obviously I feel like this film, you didn't get the full embrace of this movie. There is that mm. little bit of you that's like, this didn't... It's, it, like you said, you, you don't love it, and I don't love it mm. either. But we do uh, appreciate it, is the word I would use. Uh, definitely at the end of the day, yeah, I have full appreciation for it. Um, it is a film that wants you to feel... And certainly, like I said, my my dumb phrase, the neurons were connecting, I did get all the feelings out of it. And on that level, it's just a matter of, you know, piecing it all together to really, you know, dissect and analyze it. And in that sense, it is a very successful film. Um, but in terms of, like, whether you would recommend it or not, I think it would just be based on, hey, here's the premise of the film. Does it sound interesting to you? And then whether the answer is yes or no, that's basically the recommendation. Like, if it doesn't sound interesting to you, you're probably not going to enjoy it. And I would even rebut that. If it does sound interesting to you, you have to know what mood you're in to watch it. This is a mood piece. Mm. Like, I don't know what was the context for you watching this. Like you said, you found it on Facebook, but like... Even though I enjoyed this movie, I had to watch it for this podcast, and I'm not afforded the opportunity to be like, okay, I'm a real contemplative mood, so I'm going to watch The Wall. My context was, I just finished dinner. Mm. And there's my plate over there that's finished with food. And, oh, maybe I should scrape that in the bin now. Oh, no, I'm going to watch The Wall. (laughs) Should I turn the lights off? Yeah, I'll turn the lights off. Oh, it's getting a bit hot now. I'm going to turn this fan, you know? It's very, it's very, uh, yeah, an artificial situation in which you eventually watch the wall. It feels like mm. something you have to choose to watch because you want to watch it. Yeah, for me, it was definitely a thing of like, oh, it's getting a bit late. Do I want to watch it now or in the morning? Yeah, and I think um, the film's great, but I think there is more of a um, accessibility to the album because when you whack on an album. Mm. You know what you're doing when you put on an album. Like, I'm a person, mostly I listen to full albums of musicians. I have my shuffle Spotify list where I go through, but I um, I want to listen to David Bowie. I want to listen to Iggy Pop. I want to listen to this musical. I'll whack on the album. And when you do that, there is a thing in your brain telling you, like, I know exactly what I'm what I'm wanting right now. And I say that because when you put on the wall, you and you have heard it before or you're doing it the first time, there's this element of that where you go, I know what I'm putting on here. Well, with a movie, like there, there is that there too, but I don't know. There's, there's different experiences to listening to music. There's a vibe of music. Mm-hmm. There's an element of you're not having to pay 100% as much attention, but also your attention is drawn in different directions than it is. And also when you see a thing live, when you go to see a musical live, whether it be this or Hamilton or Rent or whatever, your focus is in a different direction as well because you've paid to go see it. You're physically going out to go see it. And Mm. so you know what you're doing. Yeah. You want to avoid the bias remorse. Yeah. And, um, but with this, it's like, I know what I'm doing when I put it on as well, but that doesn't necessarily, um, 
I don't know how to describe it, but it's like sometimes I find with movies that ability to shift where my mood is in real life isn't as easy when it is when I put on an album or go out to see a show live. What do you think about that? Do you ever have that kind of experience yourself? I think I know what you're getting at, yeah. I I guess one very simple statement we should point out about this film is that uh, tonally this film is quite depressing, quite oppressing even. Um, it's, it's very dark and it's, you know, when we were comparing it to Tommy before, we were saying that Tommy was a lot more fun and upbeat mm-hmm. and things like that. Silly. So, so definitely it is, it, it forces you to kind of go along with its mood, its tone. Um, and if you're the type of person that wants to avoid that at all costs, then obviously you're not going to watch it, but... Yeah. Yeah. Again, because we walked into it with the context of like, oh, it's night. I had an all right day. Okay, let's watch the wall. Or mm-hmm. oh, I just had dinner. Should I clean the plate or should I watch it? Should I turn off the light? You know, yeah. it's it is kind of like uh, not so much a smooth transition to like okay, depressing tone film. It's more like a yank. All right, we're in the film now. Kind of right. Thing. And we've talked about this when we've covered Lynch things. Mm-hmm. You don't just put on Fire Walk with me. Like that. You don't just do that. You can't do that. And well, say, first of all, you have to find a copy of Firewalk. Oh, but I see your point, uh, yes. Y- yes, and and the return isn't just like, oh, no, yeah, dude, I'm just going to gather up the boys <laughs> once the return. <laughs> and the same with Mulholland Drive. And, and like you say, I mean, I think the greatest example we've ever done on this podcast is the Neon Demon, mm-hmm. right? You didn't really know what you were getting with the Neon Demon, and you couldn't really... Mm, me, I had watched it already didn't have the like i had a mixed bag experience experience then i rewatched it for the podcast and i had a much greater experience because i knew what i was getting myself into a bit more and because it's such a like the wall like with maholland drive they are such a demanding films tonally um you just you've got to be on you the audience have to be on board with the movie, not the movie is winning you over, which I think a lot of movies do. Mm. Like, when you go to Black Panther, you're not having to win yourself over to that movie. The movie is trying to win itself over to you because it's like a blockbuster, mass appeal movie. The Wall is not a mass appeal movie, or even though its themes can be somewhat universal or at least very applicable. There's just, if you don't like Pink Floyd, if you don't like musicals, if you don't like being depressed, if you don't like visual storytelling over dialogue, if you don't like uh, lack of character arcs in the more conventional way, this isn't going to be as, this isn't going to be for you, um, most likely. Or maybe mm. it is. Sometimes those things can happen where a movie that's completely the opposite of all the things that you usually like can win you over. Um, I don't really have too many actual negatives to say. I just, I just, um, I I I I didn't I just don't know I just didn't love it as much as I do other films of this ilk. I am wondering if one day your mother or I will recommend Purple Rain because mm-hmm. I was thinking about other musicians that do this shit, and then there's Purple Rain where obviously Prince had his movie where he did like bring my album to life onto movie, and it's musical and weird. And Purple Rain is in, is a famous movie, but it's also one where it's like nobody talks about Purple Rain like they do about The Wall. Yes, certainly. Like my mum loves the film, and she took me to the Astor to see it once, mm-hmm. and it did strike me as like, oh, I'd heard so much about this film, but not much about what it is about. It's about Purple Rain. It's about Purple Rain. <laughs> <laughs> Even when Purple Rain came up, I'm like, okay, well, what does it mean though? But. Yeah. <laughs> it means this is what it's like when doves cry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that's all I've got to say about the wall. I found it a very moving piece. Um, well, the, there was yeah. the one other personal element for the two of us you yeah. know, that we should bring up about a, a certain blue man. Oh, a certain blue man? From the PlayStation 1. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so there's two things of note. One, Bob Hoskins was in this movie, so Mario himself was in the movie. Oh, what did you think about that i didn't did you even recognize no it? i didn't re- i didn't realize it until i was reading the truth like oh because i remembered that character because he was like this you know grumpy guy who wasn't really 
mm-hmm. uh, interacting with the guy much, but he was, you know, on the phone looking upset. I'm like, oh, that was Bob Hoskins. That's a really fun thing. And, and it reminds me, and you go, oh, he is Bob Hoskins. <laughs> he looks exactly like and Bob remi- Hoskins. And it reminds me, oh yeah, he's British. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, he's 100 percent British. He's not the classic character from Brooklyn Mario. Mario Mario. Mario Mario. Mario Mario. The one, the Mario who is Mario Mario. He was also in Hook. Cool. You haven't seen Hook? Mm-mm. He's great. It's a Robin Williams film, right? Yeah, Steven Spielberg, Robin Williams. Mm. Yes, it's got Rufio, Rufio. <laughs> and uh, the other guy who was in the film, as you found out. So the hotel manager in this movie, the guy with the mustache, that's in that sequence where they've broken into Pink's room and he's waving his finger. He was the hotel manager in Ghostbusters in the famous Slimer sequence. He's an actor that has been in multitudes of things, several Star Treks he's done over his career. But Bartek and I, because we, like I said, we just brought up Mario Mario, Bartek and I are, are, are gamers. And uh, this hotel manager guy, I found out, did the voice to one of our personal favorite bosses, villains, in the Crash Bandicoot series. He was uh, Entropy. Yes, Entropy. Who, Entropy, whose character is he's the time guy. He's like the He's the reason why the third game's all about time travel. He's the reason, he has the technology. He's the reason the third game exists. Mm-hmm. Because uh yeah, he's like a, a clock man, but he's also like this blue guy. He's a mixture of like he is supposed to be like a clock himself, but also he is a real dude. <laughs> It's very odd. Yeah, I've always got like a Jafar vibe from him. Yeah, that's an interesting way to go about it. I, yeah, I can see the Jafar influence there for sure. The face especially. The yeah. face, yeah. I guess I think of his attitude being far more like a Doctor Who villain to mm. me. Um, like the master or something. Yeah, I would, where, I was, like I control time and I'm evil. I also remember in like the opening cutscene where like you know Uka Uka and Cortex, you know mm. Clancy Brown talking to Clancy Brown. Mm. Um, you know we're like, oh, we've got the new guy, and you see in the silhouette in the background of this just like really shaky thing, and like what is this shaky thing? And, and it's eventually, making some noises. It's, yeah, and it starts walking towards them, and then <laughs> it comes out of the dark, and it's entropy, and it's like, oh man, this guy's going to be a big villain. And he was actually uh, a good boss battle too. Yeah, not bad boss battle. Probably definitely top three in that game. I would say. Yeah, of the five, yeah, top. I would say he's probably the second best. I like the engine battle in that. Mm, that one's mixed, but I, I quite enjoyed it as well. You know, two health bars, you can't go wrong. Yeah, you can't go wrong. <laughs> I don't know, I like that type of boss fight as well. I like engine. Um and it's no it's no uh uh um Tiny Tiger. What's his name? Tiny Tiger? Mm-hmm. Yeah. From that game? Or? Yeah, yeah. So his fight, the gladiatorial <laughs> ring. I know that there was... Um, Where he's really sexy for some reason. It's like, why did they make him so sexy in this well, game? Well, I remember in... um. Not that I'm not uh, not that I'm into that, of course. Well, you can be. It's okay, Ryan. Anyway, um, I'm more of a crocodile. Uh, what's his name? Dingo Dial. Dingo Dial guy. Well, that's because he has the same accent as you. Because he also looks like a, a Ghostbuster. <laughs> um, what was it? I remember on the Only Plays playthrough of Crash Three, they pointed out the really weird thing of like Tiny's the only one that was like getting into the whole theme of the game being about time travel because he was dressed like a gladiator mm. in a gladiatorial arena and the rest of them was just like oh dingo doll in an ice cave mm-hmm. entropy in this like weird clocky tower uh engine on the moon and cortex in just this you know lab looking area hey 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 now in the defense of that game Dingo Dial is in the Ice Age. That's why it makes sense. It's time travel he's in the ice Dingo Dial doesn't live in ice. Yeah, right? It's so a flamethrower in the ice. Exactly. Level. Exactly. He's got his modern things, but he's stuck in the Ice Age. And then Entropy, that makes sense. He's the time guy. He lives in like a time weird world. And Engine is like in the future. Like he's got like what we would associate future tech. And then, yeah, you're right. The End Cortex one just sucks. <laughs> That's like my least favorite battle in that whole game, I think. It's the like- final one. It's probably my least favorite Cortex battle. I I like I like elements of it. I, I don't like the fact that because your mask is fighting, you don't get like an extra hit. Yeah. But, yeah. Hey, people. As we're did talking- you want to hear more about the wall? <laughs> Sorry, that review's over. Now I was going to say Crash Three, <laughs> which is called Crash Warped. I was literally about the Crash Bandicoot Three Warped. Crash Bandicoot um, Three Warped. I was literally about to say as we were talking, like the title of the video should like slowly fade away into cra- <laughs> Pictures Power Crash Bandicoot Three Warped review. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm I'm good to go. I reckon recommend the wall i think people should at least experience it once 
again, if it sounds interesting to you, I would check it out and you might get something out of it. If it doesn't sound interesting to you, you might just No, show it to like your six year old, they'll love it. Um five year old. Five, five. Four. Four, three, two, one. You know, I think I think as you get younger, they'll actually maybe enjoy it. But Yeah. Maybe yeah. there's that middle ground of like three, four and just put it. the D V D in 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 your belly. Ready for the baby. Gather around every single attention deficit person you know, put them in a room, play the film for them. Oh, okay. Bartek's going the extra mile there. I was just implying that you should just insert it up your up yourself and have it ready for when the baby's born. It, well, if you're a flower, you can insert it inside yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Bartek. I am a flower. <laughs> um, so what is the recommendation for next week? Uh, for next week, I want us to revisit a classic, a film that we've talked about quite a bit, but one that I have not seen in God knows how long. Um, it's also, you know, to relate it to my stepbrother, Machek, one that we watched a lot uh, growing up. It mm. is Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Oh, you're skipping over the excellent adventure. Yes. Going yes. for the Bogus Journey. Because I rewatched that film like two years ago, but I haven't rewatched Bogus Journey. Yet. Well, I'm also a- I'm afraid that the that other podcast will kill me if I uh, do it. San Dimas. Yeah. Our good friends over at San- I mean, they've reviewed this one too, so Yeah, but they're 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 all about excellent adventure. Uh well, it's because they can't appreciate the fine things in life, which is <laughs> this one. So we'll be back with a discussion of Bill and Ted. That's interesting. Yeah, cool, cool. I've been thinking about Bill and Ted recently. Yeah, so. I, I was thinking like, oh, you know, you picked a musical, and this is a musical. Should we do the trilogy? But then my last American pick was a musical, so I thought, okay, let's connect it to my stepbrother. If we keep doing musicals, we'll run out eventually. That's the law. That's the law. Mm-hmm. If we became a musical only podcast, would people be really upset? Well, I know you will because eventually we'll do Moulin Rouge. That's not a musical. That's a waste of time. <laughs> so, people, you can find us on the social medias of your choice, which are mainly Facebook and Twitter. Sorry, those are the two. Mm. Spit and Posh presents. Uh, you can follow us on your podcast catcher of choice. We're on all of them practically, even on YouTube as well. For those people who like to listen through that, you can rate and review us or leave a comment on any of those that allow you to do so. Spotify. Allows you to give the five stars, uh, so you can just move your finger over mm-hmm. there and click the thing yeah. if you if use it, that. Yeah, if if you're highlighting one, two, three, or four stars, you're doing it wrong. So it's move, a five. A, move a bit more to the right, so mm. like all five of the stars are lit yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And then when you type in, like on your keyboard, the good stuff, make sure you're typing the good letters. The good I hit the microphone, stuff. sorry. That's, that's worthy of a five star yeah. right there. <laughs> I love it when Bartek hits things. Hey, the and burps. the the, the low yeah my my burp uh, little, fa- little baby burp. I almost said fetish or phase, but I couldn't think of the right <laughs> word. My burp tendencies. <laughs> mum, it's just a burp phase, and then and then your mum comes in. I thought you said it was a phase. It's a fetish now. <laughs> I was going to say, the the <laughs> lowest rated review we've ever had was about me and microphones, so there you go. And your name. Yes. Take that, Bartzik. Your <laughs> fucking name deserves a three-star review. All right, uh, I'm good to get out of here unless you have any words of wisdom you want to leave us off on. Words of wisdom? Um, ah, yes. If it's brown, flush it down. If it's yellow... Still flush the toilet. It's fucking disgusting if you don't. <laughs>